We started this morning uh, with the sermon on the deceitfulness of riches. And the text is basically Matthew 13, 22, which says that those uh, that's talking about the sower and the seed there, that when the seed's sown among the thorns, those are the ones who are uh, uh, eat up with the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. And then I'm comparing that train of thought with the book of Hosea. And the, the first part of Hosea tells you the kings it was written under. And the last king on the list is a northern kingdom, and that's under jo uh, Jeroboam II, the most uh, prosperous kingdom since Solomon in the north. And so we saw uh, the fallacy of uh, the deceived when they're dedicated to the illusion of prosperity. And that's, uh, they're very hostile. You'll find this, the world wants you to be very um, accepting of them. But they're not going to be very accepting of you. They can be hostile, but you can't. That's the way they think of it. And we saw in Amos, uh, Amos preaching to the same crowd, and that crowd responds to him by claiming that he's got some conspiracy against the king. And then they told, they say that uh, God's law is just his opinion. It's the opinion of man. And you find that happening today. The book, the Bible's just a book written by a man. No, it isn't. It might be penned by a man, but it's inspired by God. Amen. Uh, and then they, of course, push the message that you should only say what's socially acceptable so we don't hurt anybody's feelings. No, you need to say what's accurately true and godly then that'll keep people from getting hurt, period. <laughs> worry about their feelings. Tonight, uh, well, let's see, we had one more. The precaution of prosperity, we saw that. That's, um, we defined by the Bible some terms. He talked about uh, if this, he's comparing Israel and Hosea to a uh, rebellious bride who's run off. And he says there that if she doesn't turn around and act right, then he's going to reveal her um, nakedness. And that's defined in the Bible as when the disguise of self-proclaimed innocence is removed. Because all things are naked before God. And if he's going to make it naked before man, he's going to show other men your guilt. Now that's scary. Uh, we saw that he said he would turn her loose as a wilderness. And we saw the wilderness was defined as a temptation to provoke God. And there's, there's lots of times we're tempted to do the right or the wrong thing, and there's different situations we can get into. The worst one is to tempt God, to dare God. And that's what the children of Israel did in the wilderness, and they found out who would win. God did. <laughs> a lot of them died. And then we saw uh, dry ground explained in the Bible as a place where only God can save you from, and uh, thirst as being the inability to control what you say or think. And when you just uh, can't control what comes out of your mouth, you cause problems. <laughs> That's one of the early lessons you're supposed to learn in life, is just because you think a thing doesn't mean you should say it, because after you've thought about it a while, you might realize that that wasn't a good thing. <laughs> That thing needed to be needed to be thought through a little better. So make sure there's a filter between your mind and your lips. Okay, tonight. Tonight we'll begin in Hosea 2, verse 5. This is the poverty of prosperity. Now, you don't think of those two as being uh, in the same sentence, but we'll show it to be so. Hebrews 2, verse 5. Hosea. Uh, Hosea, I said Hebrews. Hosea. Hosea 2, verse 5. For their mother hath played the harlot, talking about the nation of Israel, the northern tribes. She hath conceived them, uh, she that conceived them hath done shamefully. For she said, now look at this, and de doesn't this just look like the way the devil talks? I will go after my lovers that give me. Now, that right there, that give me, that's the thing that most people love. What's in it for me? And that's her focus, is somebody's going to give me. He says in another place, and he says, uh, give me is what you love. Yes, 
Most people do. Most churches love give me. You go to church and that's the main sermon. Come often and give more often. Come give. Okay, that's not the point of it. The point is God, not you, not man. Uh, that give me my bread, my water, my wool, my flax, my oil, and my drink. Well, we've already seen God provided all those things. It was not these heathen. It was not the wicked people who gave her that. It was God, and she didn't even know it. In verse 8, Hosea 2, 8, it says, For she did not know that I gave her corn and wine and oil, and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. God gave those to her. And she was given the credit to somebody else. Now, how would you like it if you did something special for your wife, and then all of a sudden she was attributing that gift to some goofball at work or some other person? No. That's what, the way God's feeling here. He said, I gave you all of this stuff, and now you've said so-and-so did it for me. Well, we do the same things. You don't get yourself out of the jams you get in. It wasn't your smarts and your you know, extra work and time you put in. That didn't get you out. God did. Don't give it credit to anybody else. It's his. Hosea 2, verse 6. Hosea 2, 6. God speaking now, he says, Therefore, behold... I will hedge up her way with thorns. Remember we saw in Matthew, these are they that are sown among the thorns. It's coming right back into play. He says, I'm going to hedge her up with thorns and make a wall that she shall not find her paths. So he says, I know where that girl's trying to head. I'm going to, I'm going to cut her off at the pass. I'm going to put up a row of hedges. And these things are full of thorns. She's going to run into that, and she's not going to like it. But we've found, like in Matthew, the cares of this world are supposed to feel like thorns to you, but most people have become sadistic, and they love that caring for the world. Well, that's saying that you like sitting down in the thorn bush. <laughs> this world is something we've got to put up with. It's not something we enjoy. Our joy is on the other side. Okay, she says, uh, look at verse 7, Hosea 2, 7. And she shall follow after her lovers, but she shall not overtake them. And she shall seek them, but shall not find them. So her pursuit of happiness is always just out of reach. <laughs> now that's the world's idea of giving you pleasure and prosperity. It's an illusion. It's fake. They don't know what it is. And you could count on it. The devil's not going to give you anything. He's in it for him. <laughs> He's not in it for you. So when they promise you something, it's a lie. He's a liar and the father of it. So you can't count on the world to give you prosperity. Get you a job. Nice, fine paying job. It won't be long till you realize very quickly things ain't working out just as perfect as you had imagined they would. <laughs> it doesn't matter how great a job you think it is. You know why? It's part of this world. God does that on purpose. You're not supposed to get comfortable with this world's junk. <laughs> it's this world. They can't give you prosperity. Only God can. You should recognize it as a thorn. Okay, the next thing we'll see is in Hosea chapter 2, the last part of verse 7. I call this the, pros uh, the proper prosperity. Hosea 2 verse 7. I will go and return to my first husband, for then it was better with me than now. Okay, now she's acting right. God says, you know, I, he says the goodness of the Lord leads thee to repentance. So God does us good, and a man's supposed to put his thinking cap on every now and then and think back. I'm in a miserable state. When was the last time I was happy? What was the difference in those circumstances and this misery? Okay, I was close to God. I read a lot of Bible. 
I was trying to memorize some scripture, those things. And you compare that with where you are in misery, and you'll come up with the same conclusion. I'm going to return. <laughs> now, that's repentance. When a person will repent and return to God, God will do them good. Now, that's where prosperity comes from, from the one who owns it all. The devil doesn't own this world. Now, he's running it, but he's stealing it. It's not his. God's got him on leash, letting him just play around, and then he's going to yank him up, and that leash is going to be his noose. <laughs> just wait, it's coming. Now, there's two ways you can get the proper prosperity. You can do it the easy way. There is an easy way. I've just given it to you. The easy way is to obey the commands of the Word of God. Follow the Bible, and that God considers prosperity. Let's see it. Joshua 1, verse 8. Joshua 1, verse 8. The proper prosperity can be had through obedience. Joshua 1, 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. What a fanatic. <laughs> that thou mayest, the very thing we saw in Matthew, observe, as in behold, to do, as in to hear, according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way, the thing the world tries to offer, but they don't know anything about it, prosperous. And then thou shalt have good success. You know why that's good success and good uh, prospering the right way? Because there's no deception behind it. When the devil offers you prosperity and riches and all that garbage that he, he, you run after, you know, it's a deception. It's a hook. He, he's trying to look, reel you in. He's got a, a big lure of money or gold or whatever it is that you're after and there's a big hook under there okay that's the easy way but most of us don't do things the easy way <laughs> why do it the easy way when you can do it the hard way <laughs> okay that's what we've just seen israel as a nation do they were doing it the hard way he said in the chapter there that she would finally eventually say hey wait a minute i had it better better turn around and go back Okay, that's because she had seen the error of her ways. Now, not everybody ends up seeing it. Okay, you could learn what the proper prosperity is by the process of punishment. That's the way most of us learn it. Hosea 2, verse 14. Hosea 2, verse 14. He says, Therefore, behold... Now, the therefore comes immediately after all the bad things he's planning on doing to her, <laughs> to straighten her out. Guess what? We sign up, we volunteer for that list <laughs> when we don't follow close to Christ. We're, we're just putting our name on. Let me, let me have some of that. Okay. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. Okay, the word therefore. That tells us when the volume's turned up, you know, 10 de decibels on the punishment list, it's really a declaration that God is going to continue to do his work in you. You being punished is not necessarily that God's mad at you, although he may be. <laughs> It's not necessarily because he's mad at you. It's because he made a promise to complete in you something. And so he's fulfilling his word. He's duty-bound to correct us, not to punish us, although it is punished, but not to punish us. It's to complete us. That's part of his process. So if we're like the potter in the clay and we're fighting against the potter, the potter's got to do whatever it takes to make that clay behave. That's not because the potter has something, he's prejudiced against the play, the clay, <laughs> the play, <laughs> the clay. It's because he knows what he wants to do. 
and that's God. That's why we get punishment. He says he's going to allure her into the wilderness. God promises, even in punishment, to outperform the idols of deception. He does. Even in the wilderness, you can find God. You probably find him quicker in the wilderness than you do in prosperity. But there he's going to prove idols don't hold a candle to me. He'll do some miraculous things. Hosea 5.15. Hosea 5.15. God's got him in the timeout wilderness. <laughs> Hosea 5.15. I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face in their affliction that doesn't sound like prosperity they will seek me early we're supposed to now that that's a that's a basic core fact that should be uh, common but it's not so much anymore we've gotten so so far from god as a nation as a people as the world that you don't find many people in affliction seeking God. That should be a natural thing. That when you're afflicted, you look up and say, I need help. Uh, but he says right there, that's what I'm going to do. I've called to her in prosperity, and she turned me down. Now I'm going to put her in the wilderness, and I'll give her just a little time. She didn't want to hear from me, so I'll just be quiet for a while. And then she'll call to me, and she'll return to me. Uh, he said he would speak comfortably to her. I'm going to lure her out into the wilderness and I'm going to speak comfortably to her. Now, that's a good thing right there. That tells you that if you'll return to God, he's not going to light you on fire and, you know, beat you to within an inch of your life. It's, it's the devil's lie that says we can't return to God. Your sin is so horrible that God couldn't stand it and, you know, he would just beat you to a pulp. No. Sin may have a punishment, but God will be there with you the whole time. All the way. Now, he said he would speak comfortably to her. The grief and guilt of rebellion against God cannot be erased by these things the world uses. Further perversion. They run there to avoid guilt. They say, okay, you know, I'm so far from God at this point. I better just go all in to wickedness. It's not going to help you. It's going to give you more hurt. So further perversion doesn't do it. The world's idea of prosperity won't do it. Nor will preoccupation. Getting busy in a church isn't going to help you when you're rebelling from God. It doesn't matter the activity you're doing if you're ignoring God. That's right. we, know, we know one person in particular. This lady would just work herself nonstop, 24-7 if she could, doing anything for any church and any outreach and organization, burn the candle, you know, both ends, 24-7. But yet, she didn't have any Bible in her. She didn't turn 10 Sunday school, didn't go to church. Didn't, uh, I mean, she was in the church, but she wasn't going to church. <laughs> okay, priorities have to be right. Uh, the, only, the only way you can get um, this comfortable speaking from God is to return to him humbly. That's what the nation of Israel, he was calling to them, saying, go plead with your mom, tell her to come back. But she's got to humble herself to do that. Now she did. And it's only God's word that gives comfort to the condemned. You can't make it up. God's got to give it to you. You didn't offend man, so you can't run to the psychologist and get his pat on the back. That means nothing. Because in the final day, he's going to be standing at the judgment right next to you. Or at the one to follow. <laughs> Therefore, don't get it from man. God's the one who has to give forgiveness. Therefore, it can only come from his word. It's not something you eat some bad pizza, go to bed early, and you know have a vision and a nightmare about, and suddenly you have peace. No, sir, it's in black and white, his word. It doesn't boom to you out of nowhere. You don't know who that is. 
This one you know who it is. It's his word. In conclusion, Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. Galatians 6 verse 7. He says, Be not deceived. Now, isn't that a good admonishment right there? Can everybody remember that little phrase? It's three words. Galatians 6, 7. That's easy to remember too. It starts at 6, and what's the number that comes after 6? 7. Okay. (laughs) 6 is the number of man. 7 is the number of completion or perfection. Okay. So man, to be complete, needs to not be deceived. Be not deceived. David's going to quote that for us next Wednesday. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. That is, if you're deceived, it's mocking God. If you're a Christian, it is. Because you have been made light. So you shouldn't be deceived. Whatsoever a man soweth, as then the sower and the seed, that shall he also reap. One more passage, Matthew 13, 22, where we began. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word. And the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. Now, here's the thing about this. This person is not anti-God. He hears the word. He probably attends church and sits on the front row and, you know, shouts and buys all the right books and, you know, has, a, has all the right clothes on. But none of that matters if he's deceived by the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. So we've got to watch out. The, the word of God does something. It changes a man from the inside out. The devil does it the other way, from the outside in. So for us to play it safe, get it right, don't touch the outside junk of the devil. Now some of it may seem innocent, and maybe it is. But have you recognized it's a thorn? A thorn can hurt you or not hurt you. A thorn in and of itself has no power to puncture you. You've got to get close to it. So stay away from the world's stuff. Don't be deceived by the devil's offer of prosperity. God's is much better. 